ahead and stand to your feet as we start our worship this morning. And turn to your neighbor, just say, I'm really glad that you're here today. Can you do that? Turn to someone, say, I'm glad you're here today. And then tell them, I'm ready to worship.
Wow, you guys did a great job. My name is Beth, and I want to welcome you here to our service today. It is so good to be out with the sunshine. So just look at your neighbor. Just smile. Just look like you're happy to be in church, because we know we are glad to be here to worship the Lord. And our mission here at Griff is to connect people to our multicult- to Christ in our multicultural community. And we have someone with us today that has taken that beyond Grand Rapids. When I first met this little fella, he was like, here, Miss Beth, Miss Beth. He was such a good kid in children's ministries. Now he's such a good adult. Trey McBride is joining us today. And you can meet with him after church. There's a table out here in the foyer, tall round table. He is with an organization called... The Chicago Eagles the Chicago Eagles. And it's not a bunch of birds. It's actually a soccer organization and Trey is working with them to develop some new programs. But the thing about this organization we want you to know and understand is it's a Christian organization and the purpose is to spread the gospel. And there's some slides maybe that might come up and it shows Trey working with these kids and uh, sharing the gospel. Trey is an awesome soccer player so God's given him that skill and so he's also using those skills to teach and preach and share the love of God and the good news. So Trey is also looking for folks to help him with this ministry through prayer and support. Please see him after church. It's not the little Trey we all remember growing up. This is the man Trey. So look for him out in the foyer. Thanks Trey. And then if you all get your bulletin, there's this handy dandy rip out section. I, I work on this bulletin painstakingly every week. And if you find mistakes, it's because the office staff cannot proofread well. This has nothing to do with me, but this little strip, we use it for multiple things. Number one, you write your name on it to tell us you are here today. You can on the back put prayer requests or questions. It's also at the top. If we have events going on, you can check off those events. One thing we really are asking you to respond to today is the Center for Faith and Family. Last Sunday, Pastor talked about Dr. Leon Blanchett that's coming here from Olivet. And he has um, some grant from the Lilly Foundation. And he is one of the greatest professors I ever sat. I, for a week, I had his class. I learned so much from him. And he is going to share things about our faith and our family. If you're an aunt, an uncle, a parent, a grandparent, you volunteer with kids or teens, this is for you. Parents. We really did this for you, to help you as you are raising children to have a firm foundation in who Jesus Christ is and what he does in our lives. So if you're interested in that, would you put your name on the front and on the back, check off that center um, for faith and family. It's April 20th, and there's more info in the bulletin. That'll be helpful. And then when you're done with this, just put it in the offering plate, which will come by you in a minute. The last thing I want to remind you of is dinner for eight. This year, it's not a mystery. You'll know whose house you're going to, who the other guests are, and it's not even a mystery meat. You'll know what the food's about. So the sign-ups are out here in the foyer. A few more weeks to sign up. If you would do that after church, that would be awesome. We love you at Griff. And one thing we love about our Griff family is you serve the Lord through your tithes and offerings and your time. Thank you. And now we have an opportunity again to give to the Lord through our tithes and offerings. I'll have the ushers come forward and... We have multiple ways to give. Put it in the plate today, or you can give online. You can mail in a check. Our offering envelopes are even made to put in the mail. All you need to do is put the money in and put a stamp on it and send it into the office. Thank you for your faithfulness. God sees you, and he wants to bless you when you honor him in your tithes and offerings. And once the plate passes you, stand and we'll finish our worship. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, you provide for us, so in turn, we want to give to you. We thank you for Griff. We thank you for the people here that want to serve you in so many ways. And we do that through the love that we have in serving others in our volunteer hours, but also in what we give to you financially, that it will be used wisely to spread the gospel. Thank you for loving us and allowing us to serve you in this way of act of giving 
God, we just appreciate what you do for us and how you supply our needs. Amen. this ascribe to the lord the glory due his name worship the lord in the splendor of his holiness and similarly in first chronicles 16:29 ascribe to the lord the glory due his name bring an offering and come before him worship the lord
church. Good morning to you all. Good morning to you all. Good morning, church. My prayer is that the Lord will show us his glory. And he will change everything for good for all of us. It's a beautiful day to worship in his presence. And we praise the Lord that he has made it possible for us to be here. To worship at his feet. Let us pray. Our Father and our Lord, we thank you this morning. We praise you, O oh Lord, for your wonderful works in our lives. Father, we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the adoration. Our Redeemer, we thank you this morning. You came to this sinful world to redeem us. So that we can have our freedom. So that we can have our independence. We give you all glory this morning. We thank you for your protection over each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, that you left heaven above. Where the angels sing holy, holy, holy unto your name. Only to come to this sinful world. This world full of chaos. You left your heaven above to come here. You came in a humble way. You were crucified. You were beaten. But on the third day, you rose from the dead. So that we can be free from our sins. Father, we give you praise, O Lord. We give you honor, O Lord. We give you all the adoration for what you have been doing for us. You said in your word that where two or three people are gathered in your name, you'll be there with them. This morning, we are more than two. We are more than, more than three. Father, we are asking for your Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, to guide us through this service. We want your Holy Spirit to speak to us as we hear your word. We want your Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, to be our guide and our guard every day of our life. Father, we pray that the blessing that comes with this service will be for each and every one of us. Father, we remember Ron that we're going for surgery this week. I pray, O oh Lord, for your comfort. I pray that you use the doctors and all the medical team to achieve success. I pray that at the theater, O oh Lord, He will feel your presence there. You will show your glory, O oh Lord. You will show your power, O oh Lord. You will use the brain of the medical team to do the right thing. Father, I pray at the end of the thing, we will have every cause to glorify your Lord, holy name. Father, I pray, O oh Lord, our children will be going back to school. I pray for wisdom and understanding on each and every, every one of them. I pray that every bad influence will not be their portion, O oh Lord. That you will give them wisdom and understanding to do those things that are needed of them. And guide them in their chosen career, O oh Lord. Father, we come before you this morning. We pray for our missionaries, wherever they may be on the surface of the earth. That you, God, be with them, O oh Lord. Continue to guide them, O oh Lord. Shield them away from all evils. And let them know that the work they are doing is for you, O oh Lord. And that at the end of their journey on earth, you, you give them the necessary reward, O oh Lord. Father, I pray in the whole world today, there are a lot of chaos going on. Killings here and there. Father, we pray for your peace on this earth. We pray, O oh Lord, that your kingdom come, O oh Lord. We pray that you put a stop to all these evil things going on around us. Father, I pray, O oh Lord, that the various departments in this church, may you continue to strengthen them, O oh Lord. We have a lot of things coming up in this year. May you guide, guide us through it and be with us. I pray for the 
for your man, O oh Lord, that will be bringing the word unto us. May we not only be listeners to your word, but the doers of your word. Speak through him, O oh Lord. Use his voice, use his eyes, use his hand, O oh Lord, today. That as we listen, we will do your will. We will not do our own will, but we do your will, O oh Lord. So that you'll be happy with us and you give us all those things that we want. Thank you, O oh Lord, as we go this week. May your peace go before us, O oh Lord. May your peace abide with us. May we never be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Continue to shield us from all evils. Guide us, O oh Lord. Be with us, O oh Lord. For those who are looking up to you, O oh Lord, for one thing or the other, may you open the gates of heaven for them. May you answer their request, O oh Lord. Answer whatever they want for them, O oh Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness over each and every one of us. For those who need continued healing, Father, I pray that you continue to heal them. We want testimonies in this church every day. We thank you for the one we have had, O oh Lord. For Nicole, Dennis, O oh Lord. We thank you for the good results we had. We pray that you continue to do this for us, O oh Lord. Let us continue to rejoice and be glad in thee. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And now ask that we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as he forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not in temptation but deliver us from all evils. For that is the kingdom, thy power, and thy glory forever and ever. Amen. We are going to meditate today on Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse 22. Hebrews 12, 22. The writer is talking to Christians who are reading a letter. So this is a letter. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's first, firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven, who have now been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Sunday morning after church, the family's in the car, and uh, well, the mother is saying, oh my goodness, the choir was awful today, wasn't it? The father was saying, oh, that Brazilian preacher has a funny accent and the message would never end, my goodness. The oldest son said, the music was so boring. The seven-year-old girl, well, I think it was a pretty good show for a dollar. So uh, this, this little story is just to illustrate um, the question that I, I want to start with, which is, why do we come to church? It's a good question for us who are here because we came here. So this is a question for us. Why do we come to church? What are we doing here? 
um, answers can vary. We come here to learn from the Word of God. And in some churches, this is the, the, the major thing they, they do. This is the school model of church. Um, others will say, well, we come here to sing praises to God. That would be a, a concert model of church. We come because we have needs. We could call this the hospital model of church. We come to meet people. That would be a social club model of church. Even, you know, the, uh, uh, re- there is a lot of research showing now that people who participate in their religious activity, and especially church, because they studied more church than any, every other group, they say that people who participate uh, faithfully in their church are healthier and live longer than people who don't. And so uh, researchers say, psychologists say, well, the, the reason for that is that people who go to church tend to learn and have better health habits. They have uh, more positive emotions and uh, they get, get social support. So we could say, well, uh, we could go to church to improve our health. That would be the spa model of church. In this church here, I am, am always very... Um, positively surprised to find how much people who come here serve. How much service, a heart of service. So uh, I am glad to say that. This is a church where service happens a lot. All these things I, I just mentioned, they're not bad, they're good things. It's good that church offers all these things to us and we to the church. Yes, it should be present. These things should be present in church. But none of these really define what church is and what we are here for. What is the life of the church? Church is not a school. Church is not a concert hall. Church is not a hospital, not a club, not a spa. The identity of the church comes from something else, and that is worship. The identity of the church is worship. Then we have the question, then what is worship? Well, that's not our basic question, but let's start with that. Uh, Definitions of worship. There are many definitions. Dictionaries say, love and allegiance accorded to a deity. Religious expressions of love. Christian dictionaries would say, ascribing to God the worth to which he is worthy. Worship is a human response to the revelation of God. Those definitions are helpful, but that's not our our question this morning. The question is, what is the meaning of worship in the church? In a way, we could say singing, preaching, fellowship is worship. These things are worship, yes. But now let's uh, let's break it down a little more. Uh, Look around yourself. And uh, what do you see when you look around this place? What do you see? I, I think we, we can think about three, uh, three realities that you see when you look around. I mean, two you see, one is not as clear. The first reality we see is what I could call the material reality of worship. Material reality of worship. We are in a somewhat old-fashioned building. There are other church buildings that are much more modern, contemporary. Some are much older looking, older, more, more old-fashioned. But this is an old-fashioned, uh, old-fashioned building. Uh, you see a bunch of quirky people, and uh, maybe some are quirkier than others. And um, you see a band of volunteers who are just trying not to mess up too badly every Sunday, do the best they can. You see a, a little Brazilian man trying to speak English with, so, with an accent and then trying not to damage the language too much. Um, you, pe- you see people with uh, some talents, but you so- also see people with illnesses, with issues, with problems. People. 
So that is the material reality of worship. We are here with people in an old-fashioned place to worship God. The second reality I would call a special reality of worship. We see people who have special relationships. The Bible called these relationships relationships between brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters. The people you see around here, some of them have known each other for decades. They have been friends for decades. Others are just starting to come and trying to figure out what kind of place this is. Sometimes people annoy each other. Sometimes people disagree with each other. But for the most part, we put up with each other. We support each other. We pray for each other. We love each other. And we get together every week to worship together. This is a special relationship that we have a relationship connect, connecting us through worship. But this special reality of worship is also not the whole story. There's something else much bigger going on. And this is what I would call the third reality, the spiritual reality of worship. There's a brain condition called hemineglect syndrome. People who suffer that condition after a stroke are unable to pay attention to half of the world, the left half of the world. So the world consists of everything on the right side of the world and not the left. It's not that they cannot see. The eyes work well, the visual system work well, works well, the brain, the visual part of the brain works well. They just are not aware of the left side of the world. And so if you suffered from that, that disease, you would sit there and you, you would only see this part of the, I mean, you would see everything, but you would be aware only of, of the piano, the keyboards. You would hear some drums, but that would be, you'd be unaware of what they're coming from, where they're coming from. Here's the test for uh, any neglect. Uh, you ask the person, please draw, uh, draw a flower. Here's a model. And uh, th what they draw is this on the right of the flower, half a flower. And you ask the person, is, is this a flower? Yes, this is a flower. Is this a complete flower? Yes, this is a complete flower. Now, the second part of the test, imagine a clock and draw the clock. That's what the person will draw. So it's not just that the person is not be, uh, able to be aware of what's in the environment. The imaginary world, the, the thinking world of the person consists only of the right side. The person is not aware that the left is there. So uh, I would say that um, we, in a sense, we live normally every day with any neglect for spiritual things. We are not really aware of things that are actually realities. And that's, that's the other half of the world. And that's what we're going to talk about now. The thing is that it doesn't seem that anything is missing because we are not aware of it. It's like it's not there. What is this missing part of the reality of worship? Well, frankly, the Bible, I think, in my ignorant opinion, the Bible doesn't talk too much about it or very much about it. The Old Testament uh, gives us a lot of... Uh, instruction and, and, and descriptions about the worship of the, the people of Israel. The New Testament gives us snapshots of the worship of the church. In the prophets and in Revelation, we read some of the worship that is happening in heaven. But few texts describe to us the worship of the church in relation to 
the worship in heaven, in, in this spiritual realm. Hebrews 12 is an, ex, is an exception to this because it shows us the spiritual meaning of worship, of this worship that we offer to God. It offers to us, we could say, a window opened into the spiritual realm and reality of worship. The author here says first that you have come. That he used the Greek word proserchumi. You are approaching. You are coming from somewhere else. You are visiting. So you were somewhere else and now you uh, arrive here. Now you have come near and, and you have joined together. Joining who? Now, the, the letter to the Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it and we, do, we don't know who received it. We know that they were Jewish. The receivers, the readers were Jewish. And by reading the whole letter, you see that there's a, a connection between the history of worship in Israel and what we now have in Christ and an exhortation. Do not miss what we have now in Christ by looking back and staying behind. And so, in the, in the imagination of those readers, I, we could say that what they have was a worship w uh, that, that uh, included great angels. Angels who had visited the people to guide them, to, to show uh, judgment and deliverance from God. They also had great prophets, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, who, who gave them truth and, and uh, exhortation. Great leaders like Joshua and King David. Great priests like Aaron and, and Moses who, interse who, who uh, uh, interceded, who, who mediated the people between people and God. And a great system of sacrifices. So they thought of all the sacrifices that, that signify that they could pay for them their sins. But this form of worship, we would say that uh, at that time had passed the expiration date. It was no, now old news. Uh, because for one thing, it did some, some very good things. It highlighted their sins. It highlighted how far they were from God's holiness. Um, and uh, here the author calls this the Mount Sinai style of worship, and he describes it in verse 18. I will read from the NLT, New Living Translation. You have not come to worship where there is a burning fire and darkness and storm and wind. That's the old kind of worship. The sound of a horn was heard and God's voice spoke. The people cried out to Moses to have God stop speaking to them. They could not stand to listen to his strong words. Even if an animal comes to the mountain, it must be killed. What Moses saw was so hard, so hard to look at, that he said, I am full of fear and I am shaking. So worship here was based on God's holiness and God's justice, and it, it led to fear. This form of worship had its, its function in history. But now God wants his people to move forward. God wants his people now to experience a new kind of worship. So when we worship, we enter now a new place. And this place... This is what we see. We see three, three things here, or three realities. First, we see the place where God rules, and he rules with justice and grace. Verse 22, You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to God himself, who is the judge of all things. This is the Mount Zion style of worship. We have come to Mount Zion. Uh, the book of Psalms uses this expression and it says Mount Zion is, is that 
which cannot be moved by, but it remains forever. It's the city of the great king. It's the place where people rejoice because of God's decisions. It's the place where the Lord commands his blessing. This is what we approach. We are approaching the center of God's kingdom. The place where he, he's ruling and he's judging with justice. God sees all the injustices that are going on in the world. He sees them and he's ruling. God sees everything that is wrong in our place and he is ruling. God sees all the problems that you have in your life, but he is ruling. He is judging. He is ruling. But his justice is full of mercy and forgiveness. Verse 24, you have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and, and people. And to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance, like the blood of Abel. Now, you know the story of Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother Abel, and then the blood of Abel called for justice. And uh, Cain then, as a murderer, was cursed. Now, there was a, an old myth, a Jewish rabbinic myth saying that the, the blood of the martyrs, starting with, with Abel all the way to Zechariah, claimed or called for, for justice. And the, the blood of Zechariah, the last mart martyr, was uh, the, the, the king who killed him was an idolater king and a, a, a bad man. And, and uh, the blood of Zechariah that the king shed on the courts of the temple, never dried for 250 years. This is the myth. For 250 years, it bubbled on the floor of the court, court of the, the temple until Babylon, Babylon came and, and then conquered the land and, and the, the revenge was done. The, the, the blood was avenged. That was the mindset of revenge. It will happen. It's revenge. But Jesus reversed this story. Now we have here Jesus, who was just, who was good, who was pure, who never sinned. And he was killed because of our sins. He took away, and his blood took away the curse that belonged to us. So we are not cursed anymore. Jesus connected God to us. So now, as 1 John, first letter of John says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. So we approach the place where God rules with justice and grace. That's our worship. But our worship is also a place where the angels worship joyfully. Verse 22, and also here there are thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Can you imagine that? As we worship thousands and thousands of angels. Revelation 5 describes a little further this scenario. I, I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands. And they encircled the throne. And in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy to receive. And he, he has seven words of worship. Worthy to receive power and wealth, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and praise. Who are these creatures? 
angels. The word angel actually is a nickname. The, the Hebrew word was malach and uh, the Greek um, angelos. And this is a nickname for a part-time job they have. Part-time job is to bring us messages. It's not all they do. The, the full-time, the daytime angel job is to worship God. From time to time, God says, hey, you, Gabriel, come here. I have a mess. you to carry a message down there. These angels are, he receive other names um, in the book of Job, sons of God, morning stars. And imagine these morning stars are here worshiping with us. Heavenly beings, holy ones, heavenly hosts in Luke. Hebrews, ministering spirits, ministering spirits worshiping with us. They have proper names. I mentioned Gabriel. There's also Michael. The tradition, uh, Jewish tradition, gives other names to them, Raphael. Um, they have different positions. They are archangels and, and, uh, and cherubim and seraphim. We don't know if there's one archangel or more. Um, some ap appear like creatures, very strange creatures with faces of animals. Uh, others appear like regular guys that couldn't be distinguished from people, men. But they have supernatural powers, like, like uh, for example, vanishing in smoke. And also they have limitations given by God. They're limited. Angel, angels don't appear materially to us very often. But from time to time, there are stories of people that are so strange that the explanation seems to be angelic. For example, Billy Graham wrote in his book many years ago, it was during a time in which there was, uh, in Iran, there was still some freedoms. And uh, it, he says this, a Persian culpator, that's a Bible salesman, was accosted by a man who asked him if he had a right to sell Bibles. Yes, he answered. We are allowed to sell these books anywhere in the country. The man looked puzzled and asked, Well, how is it then that uh, you are always surrounded by soldiers? I planned three times to attack you, and each time, seeing the soldiers, they left you alone. There are many other stories. Uh, missionaries, uh, remember hearing a missionary saying that uh, a, a whole tribe came to attack the missionary house, and they never attacked, surrounded it, never attacked it. And uh, they, some days later, went away. And later on, years later, he asked, why didn't you, talking to the chief, why didn't you attack us? And the chief said, well, you had soldiers around your compound. We couldn't. You had warriors around your compound. So these are beings that uh, worship with us. But there is also a third group here in this place where, uh, which are called all God's people. All God's people. You have come to the assembly and church. He uses a word, that, this is word appears one time in the New Testament, panichiri. And he puts it together with ecclesia, which means those called outside uh, in response to a herald. And then the uh, panichiri means the um, agora, the marketplace for everyone. And uh, these two together suggest way to us a great celebration, a feast, a festival, where all those who were called and who accepted the invitation are present. All. None of them is missing. It describes them as God's firstborn children, those who are already enjoying their inheritance, whose names are written in heaven. The spirits of the righteous made perfect. The spirits of the righteous made perfect worship with us. He used the term to tell you a man on, which is 
the same word that used, Jesus used um, on the cross, the last word of the cross, according to John, it is finished. It is complete. These people arrived at the goal, at, at the place of arrival. At the funeral of a very dear relative, the pastor officiating the ceremony said, uh, let's call him Joe, it's not his name. Joe was not perfect. When he said that, uh, people uh, chuckled and some people looked at each other. Yeah, we knew him, yeah, he was not perfect, yeah. Um, and then the pastor continued, but now he is. But now he is. Now, death does not make us saints. It looks like that when people die, everybody who dies is a saint, right? No, it's not the case. Death, however, completes the process that theologians call sanctification. It completes it. These people are now in the waiting room of resurrection. But they wait in the waiting room, worshiping. And we participate with them. We worship with them. Now, what, what does this have to do with us? How does this view of worship affect us today? What are we to do in preparation to worship, considering what we are actually approaching? The text tells us, starting in verse 14, so we go before because the text will, will tell us what to do and then the reason why. So the first thing is to make peace. In verse 14 of uh, Romans 12, it says, Work at living in peace with everyone. Now, this peace is not simply not causing trouble. I, I'm not going to rock the boat. But it is making peace. It's building. It's Matthew 5, 9. Jesus said, that, uh, said this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And his brother James said, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So we need to be aware that one of our jobs in life is to make peace around us. To be people who are living and spreading peace. But second, he says, seek holiness. In verse 14, work at living in a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Verse 16, Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. So the example here, as a negative example, Esau had his values upside down. It was food first and then God. And we live in a world in which our generation also has upside down values. Fun first, God last, if he's included. But we work at living a, a, a godless life, or a, a holy life. And third, be alert. Verse 15, look after each other so that, one, uh, that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. So look after each other so people will receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. This is a, re a reference to Deuteronomy 29, 18. I am making this covenant with you so that none, no one among you, no man, no woman, no clan, no tribe will turn away from the Lord our God to worship these other gods of the other nations. And so that no root among you bears bitter or poisonous fruit. 
Psychologists uh, uh, Friedman and Fraser discovered a very interesting phenomenon. If you agree to do a small thing, even against your values, you are likely more, much more likely to agree to do a much bigger thing against what you think is right. And so uh, here's an example. This is called the food in the door effect or phenomenon. Here's an example, a salesperson, a salesman, comes to you and starts talking to you and suddenly he says, can you please hold this pen for me and while I get my, my pad here? And you hold the pen for him. Thank you very much. Now, uh, could you please, would you please take this very short questionnaire, five questions, which we're just after people's opinions about a product, would you do that for me? And you say, oh sure, yes. People who say yes to these little things are many times more likely to buy the product than people who say no. The foot in the door effect. So watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. As a foot in the door, a little here, a little there, and then things open for what you don't really want. The conclusion to this passage, verse 28, takes us to the final conclusion here. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray. Our Father, it is with gladness and thanksgiving that we get together to worship you, but it, it's also with awe, with respect. We are not alone. We have you above all. We have myriads, myriads of angels. We have those who are made now perfect, and we have each other to worship together so that we will be holy, we will promote peace, and we'll give you all the glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As part of our worship, we want to gather together at the Lord's table and share as the people of God in the grace of Jesus Christ that makes our worship possible. Uh, so I'm going to invite the servers to come forward and prepare to serve you. Uh, just to remind you, everyone is welcome to receive communion today and participate in this. Uh, you don't have to be a member of this church. We do ask that uh, you would acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior at whatever place that you're able to do that, or if you would like to do that this morning. Uh, it would be a privilege for you to, uh, or for me rather, uh, if you would share that with me. But let's come to the Lord's table. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless this moment as a part of our worship. That we would humble ourselves before you and in trust allow you to examine us and bring your healing and your hope to our lives. So we ask that you would take this bread and this cup and infuse it with your presence with us today. In Jesus' name.
one who is worthy of our worship, the one who is holy and lifted high. He says to us in his own words in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's our Jesus. He came to his disciples, and in what we know as the Lord's Supper initiated in the Gospels just before he was crucified and raised again, he takes bread and he breaks it, and he gives it to his disciples. It's about his presence with us, that in flesh he dwells with us, and now by his Holy Spirit. And he says, take and eat this and be thankful. takes the cup says this is the cup of my blood a new covenant it's paid for by his own life for our benefit it is about power from his life to impact ours to cleanse us and to redeem us take and drink this and be thankful Father we are thankful Our hearts are full and overwhelmed by your love. But Father, may we take that love from this moment and this place. Die to ourselves that you might live through us. And that same love that we've experienced that has changed us and is changing us might be shared wherever you place us, wherever we go, in the presence of whomever we are with by the power of your spirit and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can stand as we, as we worship.
enjoy the ruling and authority of the living God, who judges with perfect justice and mercy. Receive the loving sacrifice of Jesus Christ, whose blood gave us forgiveness, life, and hope. Receive the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control granted by the Holy Spirit, so that you can always in Mount Zion style fellowship, worship God with thanksgiving, reverence, and awe.